what was Jesus's relationship to the law and the prophets? What was Jesus's relationship to the Old Testament? Did Jesus come to abrogate the Old Testament, or did he come to further establish the Old Testament? Well, the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew 5, verse 7 to 20, gives us a clear, clear guide as to what Jesus's relationship was with the Old Testament. And we'll read there today, verse Matthew 5, verses 7 to 20. But before I do that, would you please join me in a word of prayer? Father God, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your word, and that your word is clear, God, and it's powerful, Lord, and alive and breathing, God. And Father, please speak to our hearts, God, in your word. And please convict us of our sins, God, and please convict us of our wrongdoings, God, and our transgressions. And Lord, bring us to you, God. Draw us to your heart, God. Father, please lead us to, lead us to the cross, God, and minister to all of us as we read your word. As we always sing, in the name of Jesus, amen. So open with me to Matthew 5, verses 70 to 20. We're continuing our study of Matthew 5 and the Sermon on the Mount, and we're really getting into it now. So this is what it says. Jesus here speaking says, Do not think I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jaw or one tittle by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks from the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So there's something called antinomianism. And this is a very popular belief among evangelical Christians even. And what it is in essence, and you'll get varying definitions depending on what sources you get your definitions from, but the true definition of antinomianism is it's essentially a belief that the law no longer applies to us, that the law no longer is necessary, that Christ, since he came, we no longer have to observe the law or obey the law. And that's absolute heresy. And I'll get into the relationship we as believers have with the law and the relationship Christ had with the law. But we have to first establish that the law is still relevant to the life of the believer in the church age, in the dispensation of grace that we're in. It's still relevant to us now as it was in the Old Testament. Now that we're in the New Covenant, the law hasn't been abrogated or annulled. It's still applicable to us today, and it's still very important. In fact, Jeremiah, he, when he was speaking of the prophesying of the new covenant that would come, he said the law would be written in the believer's heart. So the difference between the law in the Old Testament and the law in the new covenant is that the law in the Old Covenant was written on tablets of stone. But the law is now written on the believer's heart. So if you're a believer today, the law is written on your heart. Not only do you know it from the word of God, but you know it in your heart. And that's one of the things that we find in the Old Covenant. That's, uh, excuse me, in the New Covenant. That's different from the Old Covenant. But let's get into the specific relationship that Jesus had with the law and how to apply this to our life. Because one thing that's really hard to do is, well, what does this mean? How extreme should I be in the application of the law? Could this lead to legalism? And we'll get into all of that. But starting in verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Jesus here says, he came not to destroy the law. And this is important because this is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And this is his sermon to his disciples. So Jesus is setting forth his doctrine, his philosophies, his, the truth. Jesus is setting forth the truth. Whatever God speaks is truth, correct? So Jesus here is setting forth the truth. And he's laying it out here early. And in, earlier on in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, I did not come to, des to destroy or abolish the law. What does he say he did? He said, I came to fulfill. Now, what does Jesus mean when he says, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets? Well, it means that the law and the prophet, the, specifically the prophets, were all prophesying of the coming Messiah. And we know that Jesus fulfilled that and that he is the coming Messiah. We know that Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets and that the Old Testament, which is what the law and the prophets are, were essentially a shadow of the things to come. They were merely 
awaiting and eagerly hoping for the coming of the Lord, which is Jesus. So Jesus fulfilled along the prophets and all the things they were pointing to, the sacrifice of the lambs, Passover, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, all the messianic prophecies, um, all the different all the different types, typologies in the Old Testament, they all pointed to Jesus. And in him, they find their fulfillment. And ultimately, the promise of the new covenant, which is mainly the old covenant, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So all of that is fulfilled in Jesus, and he is the fulfillment of that. So that's what it means when it says that Jesus did not come to abolish the law or destroy the law, but no, he came to fulfill it. And he came to fulfill it to the fullest measure. See here in verse 18, Jesus says, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law, till all is fulfilled. Now in verse 18, there's something important to note here the way Jesus starts out. He says, For assuredly I say to you. In Greek, that word for assuredly is amen. So Jesus here, it's a signature of Jesus, which no one else we have know that really does this. Jesus starts out his statements by saying amen or truly, truly, or verily, verily. And you notice that of Old Testament prophets, whenever they make a prophecy, they'd always say, thus saith the Lord, or um, hear the voice of the Lord. But Jesus said, assuredly, I say unto you. Jesus said, truly, truly, I tell you. So Jesus here says, I'm not, a rep says, I'm not saying, I'm not just prophesying. He said, I'm not just a prophet saying what the Lord has told me. He said, I, when he says, assuredly, I say unto you, when he's saying, truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus is saying, I am God. Jesus is saying, this is my words. And he's saying, my words are God. He's not saying I'm speaking here for God. No, he's saying, I am speaking as God. I'm speaking with the authority of God. And we have to note that because every time you see a prophecy in the Old Testament or discourse on prophecy, the prophets will always start off by saying, thus saith the Lord, hear the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord came to me saying, but Jesus says, assuredly, showing his authority. Jesus here demonstrates to us his great authority. But what is he telling us? He says, assuredly, I say to you, Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So in Hebrew, that word jot is yod. And essentially that is an apostrophe or a, a, a mark of grammar. It's literally a minute little mark on a Hebrew word or, an, or this equivalent of like an apostrophe. So Jesus is saying the smallest little dot in the Old Testament will not pass away. He's saying the smallest little dot in the Old Testament is inspired. So Jesus here comes to confirm that the Old Testament is the inspired word of God. He's here to tell us that the Old Testament is all pure, perfect, and holy. It's all the word of God. And something that's very sad that goes on today is you hear a lot of times people say, well, that's, that's the old covenant. Speaking of things like homosexuality, which is not true because it's mentioned in the New Testament as well. But people will say, well, God didn't approve of homosexuality on the old covenant, but we're in the new covenant. But let me ask you this. And that's not true because Romans 1 speaks on homosexuality. There's other passages. Even Jesus speaks about sexual immorality. So in the new covenant, in the New Testament, homosexuality is addressed as a sin as well. But think about in the old covenant. When God says that a homosexuality is an abomination, when he says that's repugnant to him, how in the world could that change because we're in the new covenant? If something is so repugnant to God in the old covenant, why would it no longer be repugnant to him in the new? We know that God does not change. Uh, Hebrews 13, 8, 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God in Malachi 3, 6, 10, it says, I, O sons of Jacob, do not change. God is immutable. He's an unchanging God. So if something was repulsive to him in the Old Testament, it is equally repulsive to him in the New Testament. So these lies that people spread that, oh, well, that was just Old Covenant is not true. Now, if you will open with me to Colossians 2, uh, verses 16 through 17, there is something I do have to address because, um, you know, it gets into controversy. But here, so here's Paul writing, and he says, 
Let no, so let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So the Apostle Paul here says that the ceremonial law of the Old Testament, uh, the Levitical law, the Mosaic law, uh, not Mosaic law like the Old Testament, like the Ten Commandments, but the Mosaic law on Sabbath regulations and ceremonies and sacri animal sacrifice, that no longer takes place in the New Covenant. You would, it would be sinful of you now to sacrifice an animal for your sins to God. No, that's, that's no longer necessary, and that's actually no, lo that's no, that's no longer good to do. God wouldn't accept that sacrifice because that was all pointing to Christ. That's why Paul here says the substance is in Christ. So do you have to go to, do you have to honor the Sabbath on Saturday? Absolutely not. Do you have to celebrate the ceremonies that the Jews had to celebrate? Absolutely not. Do you have to make sacrifices of animals for your sins? Absolutely not. Because that was all pointing to Christ, but the substance is in him. But the fullness of those ceremonies and the fullness of those regulations is brought out in the New Testament. The fullness of them and the spirit of them is still revealed. So Jesus, as we'll go into later, when he talks about murder and when he talks about adultery, and Jesus affirms the Ten Commandments, and by the way, the Ten Commandments are still fully applicable to our lives. We still need to be obedient to the Ten Commandments. But when Jesus says, it's been said unto you, do not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you look at a woman in lust in your heart, you commit adultery. So Jesus not only said, obey the law externally, but Jesus said, obey the law internally in your heart and in your mind. And if you think about it, you could obey the Ten Commandments perfectly and go to bed feeling like a champ. But what did Jesus say? He said the two greatest commandments are this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And the second like it is to love your neighbor as yourself. And that is impossible to perfectly do. So you can do every single one of the Ten Commandments, but yet fail to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And yet fail to love your neighbor as yourself and go to bed needing the forgiveness of God. It's impossible for a human like us to fully love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. It's impossible for a human like us as in a sinful state to fully love our neighbor as ourself. So we can obey the Ten Commandments but fail here, and we've still fallen short of the line. We've still transgressed and fallen short of God's perfect, righteous, and holy standards. And isn't that amazing? And isn't it amazing that Jesus took the law and he applied it further? He said, don't, not, not only do you not commit adultery physically, don't commit adultery in your mind. Don't lust after a woman in your heart. Don't lust after a man in your heart. He said, it's even harder now. <laughs> it, wasn't, it, it was easier for the, in the Old Testament just to not commit adultery, but now don't commit adultery in your heart. Right? That's the difficult, it, it's even more difficult now. And I have to address uh, the topic of legalism because what people say is, well, you're just being legalistic or when people say, I don't want to drink or when people say, I don't want to uh, take part in this action or when I don't want to watch this TV show or people say, well, you're being legalistic. Okay. That's not a proper understanding of legalism. Legalism is the using the law or trying to be obedient to the law to gain salvation. Legalism is obeying the law or work-based salvation to go to heaven. That's what the Pharisees did. They were legalists because they obeyed the law to the fullest extent in their view Yet they were short of heaven because they hadn't had the love of God in their lives. And they didn't truly see the beauty and the fullness of the law. And they didn't truly live that out. But legalism is not living a holy life. Legalism is trying to use the law to justify yourself. That's what legalism is. So oftentimes legalism is taken out of context. It's not truly represented as what it really is. But continuing in verse 19, and we can further apply this to our lives. He says, Whoever therefore breaks from the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is saying, if you do not follow the law, that's sin. But to not follow the law and teach men to not follow the law is extremely odious to God. 
to not only disobey the law, but to teach men not to obey it, that person shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. He says, if you obey the law and teach men to do likewise, you shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, we do have to note that one or another, the people mentioned here will make it into the kingdom of heaven, whether you're least or great in this greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you made it. But wouldn't you want to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Why not do what is honoring to God and teach what God says? Not only obey the law in your own life, but teach it to others. Not only be fully obedient to Christ in your own life, but teach others to be fully obedient to Christ. Teach what you practice and practice what you teach. Both are important. It's not, it's not only actions. It's also your words. It's not only your, your, what you do every day. It's also what you teach every day that matters. And Jesus points that out. Now, closing in verse 20 here, Jesus says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this verse was probably extremely perplexing to Jesus' disciples. And mind you, this was early on in Jesus' ministry, so Jesus didn't, have, didn't yet have this extreme opposition from the Pharisees. But we know that the Pharisees represented the opposition group, Jesus. They uh, despised Jesus. They hated Jesus. They were the chief culprits in getting, putting Jesus up on the cross. But there's something commendable about the Pharisees, and that the Pharisees were studious and scrupulous students of Scripture. The Pharisees studied better than anybody. I doubt for sure myself or anybody probably living now studies the word of God like the Pharisees. The Pharisees knew scripture like nobody's business. The Pharisees had the entire Old Testament memorized. And Jesus says that our righteous needs, excuse me, our righteousness needs to surpass that of the scribes and of the Pharisees. Our obedience to the law needs to be greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees. How can we do that? Well, it's a righteousness that's not our own. It's a righteousness of Christ. And Christ isn't saying that the Pharisees are righteous. What he's trying to do here is say, the works that the Pharisees do, even if you do greater than them, you will never make it into heaven. You need a righteousness that is above yourselves. And that righteousness comes from Christ. All your works, all your good deeds apart from Christ, are like filthy rags to God. He's such a holy and awesome God. So all our good works totaled up can never earn us salvation. It's merely the righteousness of Christ and accepting the, uh, the sacrifice of Christ and coming to grips with our sin and turning away from and repenting from our way of life and turning to Christ. So as you go about your week, as you go about your days, ponder what Christ said about the law and ponder your relationship to it and understand that there's a fullness brought out in the new covenant of the law, even greater than that of the old, that, than that was what was brought in the old covenant and go about making sure to honor God. In fact, Psalm one, David says, uh, who is, who is, in fact, I'll read it. Psalm open with me to Psalm chapter one and David here starting out in the Psalms, he opens with a beautiful he opens, he opens beautifully and he says this, if I can pull the hair, excuse me. Psalm 1, David says, Blessed is the man who walks on the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And, as he, and in his law, he meditates day and night. David says, Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Read Psalm 119. It's all about the law of God. And David's, or the author of Psalm 119's expressive love for the law of God. Do you have a love for God's law? God's law shows his heart. And now it's written upon our hearts, it's written upon the stones of our heart. So as you go about your days, delight in the law of God. And make sure you are living out the law of God. Be obedient to what God tells us to be obedient. And understand, we don't have to, we don't have to do the, now I'm not saying we have to obey, we have to go to Saturday for the Sabbath. I'm not saying we have to obey these ceremonial sacrifices. That's not what I'm saying. But the richness of the law, the law that's written upon our hearts, the law that's affirmed by Jesus in the New Testament, 
Live that out in your life. Would you join me in a word of prayer before we end? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for your word and thank you for your law. And God, please help your people to delight in your law. God, for you say, blessed is the man who delights in your law. And Lord, I pray that we take delight in your statutes and your commandments and that God, we would follow them and live them out in our lives, oh God. And please go before us and behind us and cause your face to shine upon us, God. I ask all these things. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining me, guys. I'll see you next.